Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. I'm glad that you could be here with us today. Uh, today, across the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, we're celebrating the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. This is the 37th annual uh, celebration of that uh, event. And our lesson today will focus on that. We'll continue with two passages, one that's in the book of Ezekiel, where we have been, and we'll look at Psalm 139. I think probably one of the more familiar psalms to most of us in the book of Psalms. Uh, but, but let's begin by thinking about what Ezekiel has to say about this uh, in, in his passage here where he talks about the judgment against Jerusalem or Judah and Samaria or the northern kingdom. In Ezekiel 16 uh, and 23, he talks about this particular problem. In Ezekiel 16, he describes God's grace to the children of Israel, what he has done for them from the beginning in establishing a covenant with them and, and providing for them over the generations. However, God's people took those blessings and they began to use them to worship idols. And as we'll see in these passages, they even sacrificed their children to pagan gods and, and, and entered into evil partnerships with evil nations. Uh, God told them that he would uh, bring judgment on them. But he continued to maintain his promise to both the northern and southern kingdom that he was committed to them and that he one day would restore them. But let's look at these passages in chapter 16. Verses 20 and 21 in chapter 16 give us the picture. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. God sees these children as uniquely his possession. And he is very disturbed about what's going on here. Most of the time in the, in the Old Testament, when we see the children of Israel stray and worship idols, you see mention of high places. And when you see that mention of high places, it's usually uh, devoting themselves to worshiping pagan gods and idols. In these verses, in the verses that lead up to 20 and 21, uh, Lamar Cooper describes the situation like this. They were wickedly ironic that the people used God's gifts to build shrines and make idols of gods that were non-existent. They took their fine jewelry, they uh, constructed male idols uh, of gods and engaged in ritual sex uh, uh, with uh, fertility cults. Uh, they, they remember the, the golden calf out in the desert. This is just a repeat of that kind of thing. They took fine clothing to put on these idol, idols. And yet all these things had been gifts from God and they were not theirs to use indiscriminately. The climax comes here uh, when God charges Israel in verses 20 and 21. And Ezekiel accuses them of sacrificing to these pagan gods, God's most precious gift his children. Uh, such behavior was an undeniable evidence of greed and selfishness and self-will that are always part of a materialistic society. Such conduct uh, produced injustice and violence and decadence and blindness, and it threatened the sanctity of human life. And when there is blindness to the sanctity of human life, Everything else is fair game. And destruction of societies is not far behind that. These pra practices mark the climax of the surrender of the fundamental convictions of the children of Israel's ancient faith to Yahweh and in favor of the Canaanite heathenism. They had, they had come into the land and they didn't do what God said. He said, rid this land of all of these Canaanite practices and the Canaanites, and they did not do it. The people's conduct was so depraved that even the Philistines looked at them and were shocked by what they were doing. Uh, the statement, you slaughtered my children, reaffirmed what children mean to God and that they belong first to God. He created life. And parents did not have the right uh, 
or anyone else have the right to end a child's life. God is the person who has control over that. God never commanded human sacrifice at any point in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, when Jeremiah writes about it in, in Jeremiah 7, 31, he says, And they have built the high places of Topheth to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it ever come to my mind, God says. This was not something that was in God's mind at all. And you'll find when you look at the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, that often uh, they, 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 they advocate for the weak of the of society, for widows and for children, for people who can't take care of themselves, but especially children. God places a high value on children. Uh, we'll be better people if we take care of children in our society. Now let's look in chapter 23 in Ezekiel where he talks a, a bit more about this. In tap, chapter 23, chap, verses 36 through 39, Ezekiel writes this, The Lord said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ohola and Ohalaba? Then confront them with their detestable practices, for they have committed adultery and blood is on their hands. They committed adultery with their idols. They even sacrificed their children whom they bore to me as food for them. They have also done this to me. And at the same time, they defile my sanctuary and desecrated my Sabbaths. On the very day they sacrificed their children to their idols, they entered my sanctuary and desecrated it. That is what they did in my house. God said, you have done very detestable things. You have taken my children. He calls them his children, his possession. And, and, and he had, that you have sacrificed them as food to the idols. So the, the idea here in the symbolic sacrifice of children was that, they, that these children were going to be food for these uh, made up gods. And he says that, that, that I'm not going to allow that. And so in chapter 23, we didn't see the beginning of this, that Ezekiel tells a parable about two sisters, Ohola and Ohalaba. They're both prostitutes. Ohola is uh, Samaria and Ohola, Ohalaba is Jerusalem. And, and so uh, Ezekiel says that both of these people, they prostitute themselves. And that means that the countries have prostituted themselves and, and taken on the ways of foreign countries. And so now they're going to face judgment. God said he would humble Jerusalem and Judah. He would humble the northern kingdom and he would bring nations against them and, 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 bring, and bring them down to destruction. God would humble both of these nations to the extent of their evil. And when that had happened, they would know that he is the Lord. You know, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel is always saying that then they will know that I am the Lord. And he mentions three significant things. One is defiling his sanctuary, the temple. There, was, there were idols in the temple at this time. Uh, desecrating the Sabbath. They weren't keeping the Sabbath as they had been instructed in the Ten Commandments and sacrificing his children on the altars of idols. From the darling of a great nation, Israel sank to the level of embracing the lowest of, eth of practices among pagan people. And so... Over time, they had become callous to their sin. You know, that can happen to us too. Over time, it's one little thing here, one little thing there, and pretty soon we're, we're, we're accepting things that never would have been accepted earlier in our walk with the Lord. Uh, when our society sinks to the level that the Hebrews sank to, that the Israelites sank to, and devalue human life, and in particular, the lives of children, the collapse of that society cannot be far behind. And that's what Ezekiel is saying to them here. Now, let's shift gears here and look at this in a little bit more positive sense because we talked about punishment in Ezekiel. David talks about the very miracle of human birth. Look with me in Psalm 139. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And David talks about the intimate all-knowing, ever-present relationship that is part of his creation. 
David says, God knew me completely. Look at these words here in the first six verses. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You receive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So what David has done here is to write down what he believes about God's powers and what God's perception is. It staggers David's imagination to the point that he cannot comprehend what God has done. And he says that that care for me began in the womb of my mother. Uh, in, in these passages here, there are 13 personal pronouns used. 13 personal pronouns. This is very intimate language. The idea expressed here is that the conception of God knowing me altogether down to the very roots of my being, David says, you have exposed me. You, you know everything about me. The idea here is making a cutting into man and laying bare his very nature. It's, it's as if uh, people building a railroad needing to make a cut through a hill. They cut down layer after layer after layer ever deeper till they get to the bedrock. And that's what, what David says God has done. He's cut into me. He knows all of the deep lying parts of my being. He knows my heart. He knows my personality, my inmost self. He knows me completely. When David uses the Hebrew you here, the, the Hebrew word for you in these verses, it's emphatic, which means that God alone is capable of possessing this kind of knowledge. It's absolute knowledge of all of his creatures. And God alone has that ability. A.W. Tozer says that the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. And what he means by this is, if you don't think God is all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, omniscient, then you're selling God short and you're placing your faith in things now that are not nearly what God is when you, when you worship idols. God, the idea here is that, that, that nothing can escape God's omniscient scrutiny. God knows everything. Warren Wiersbe writes about God's thorough knowledge of each person, giving us all the more reason to pray honestly to God and walk uprightly before Him. His knowledge of you ought to encourage you and make you confident. He has an intimate knowledge of you. How else can you pray but honestly? Because if you're dishonest before God, He knows immediately. You can't be dishonest with God. You have to be honest with Him. In verses 2 through 5, we, we learn about the extent of God's knowledge with each of His creations. God knows not merely the spoken word which men can, can hear, but He knows the true meaning behind that spoken word. He knows why the person was prompted to utter it in the first place. Before the thought was formed into words and found expression, God knew what it was going to be. He knows what I'm going to say here this morning. He knows what you're thinking right now and what you may be saying soon. So David says, this is how God knows me. And so when he comes to the end of these first 12 verses with a concluding statement, it's an infinite knowledge that baffles David and anyone else. Look at verses 7 through 8. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise up on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light 
to you. God knows everything about us and he's present with us in all places that we might be. We cannot get away from God. We cannot hide uh, hide from God, even in the dark, David said. So if God is omniscient, it stands to reason that he would be omnipresent. And that's exactly where this, this scripture goes, that God is with us in every situation, everywhere present. We cannot escape him. We cannot hide from him. His power and presence are universal. The psalmist question does not imply that he wishes to escape God, but that escape would be impossible if he wanted to. He could not get away from God. The spirit of Jehovah in the Old Testament is always presented as a living energy of a personal God. And that's what God wants to be with us. He wants to be a personal God with us, just as Jesus is our personal Savior. Jesus is God in a different form. He he is our personal Savior, and He is a personal manifestation manifestation to each one of us. A.F. Kirkpatrick said, those who think to escape God's notice in the night as they avoid the eye of men, but do delude themselves. You cannot escape God. It is impossible. You have to be honest with God in every situation because he already knows the truth. That's an awesome thought. It's an awesome thought. Kind of, uh, uh, and, and kind of thought that sometimes puts us in a very, very small, small situation when we compare ourselves to God. You can't get away from God. David even said, the wings of the dawn, which spread so quickly. You know, when the sun comes up in the morning or it goes down in the afternoon, to, if you want to catch a glimpse of the sunrise or a glimpse of the sunset, you need to be there at the moment because it'll be gone. It'll be fleeting. And so God is that way. I like the statement that uh, Alexander McLaren made ab- about these verses. McLaren, the great Scottish preacher, declares that this psalm begins with perhaps the grandest contemplation of the divine omniscience that was ever put into words. He knows us each all together, whether we like it or not, whether we try to hinder it or not, whether we remember it or not. God knows us. And just two primary thoughts here I'd like to point out, two observations. One For God to know his creation as described in this psalm is not only an indication of his great creative power, but also an indication of how much he cares about his creation and what he considers it to be. We've been placed at the pinnacle of God's creative order and are to be valued in that light, protected and not to be misused, abused or slain. See the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. And, and, and that means you, you're not supposed to abuse the, the, what God's great creation. The second observation is this. For God to know me altogether may at times be both a welcomed and an unwelcomed thought. You know, there are times when you do things in your life that you don't want other people to know about. And while we might be able to hide that from parents or spouses, brothers, sisters, or other people that we know, impossible. It is impossible to hide that from God. He knows everything that there is to know about us, both good and bad, even our thoughts. That is, that is really sobering to realize and to sit and think about. Now look what uh, David writes in verses 13 and 14. He talks about God's role in his creation. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God must know the psalmist perfectly, for he ordered the first beginnings of his life and foresaw all his destiny. What David is saying here is, that the greatest miracle of all is human birth. God can make life. He gives each baby a genetic structure he wants that that person to have. 
If you, ha if you leave God out of your life, you'll never be able to fulfill what you were born for, what God wants you to do. And so David reflected on the growth of, uh, of a baby in the mother's womb. Perhaps he was reflecting on his own growth in his mother's womb. The Lord that laid first claim on David's life for he created him. The Hebrew word here, uh, the inmost being is sort of interesting when he talks about this seed of an emotion. In the, in the Hebrew, it's a reference to the kidneys. And the kidneys in the Hebrew mindset was designated as the place of emotion and affection. We probably wouldn't do that, but in the Hebrew language, that's what it was. David affirmed that God had knit him together in his mother's womb. The word knit stresses God's perfect care for David's unformed body. It's a, it's a formation of a, of, a, of a sacred work that God is bringing about and it's purposely brought together about by God. And God does not want anyone to purposely interrupt this creation process that devalues life that he has created. David further affirmed that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. The word fearfully translated here uh, contains the ideas of awe and wonder. And who could have ever seen a baby, a newborn baby, without having awe and wonder? How this came to be, how this came to be from its beginning. Uh, the word translated wonderfully comes from a verb that means to be surpassing or extraordinary. There's no other event in life that can match that. The birth of a child and describes what God's mighty works are. Uh, in uh, Psalm 118, 23, uh, the psalmist writes, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Talking about birth, about the creation of a human being. The word can denote a variety of creative acts that God does, but here it highlights the creation of life in the womb. The word wonderful comes from the same root as the word translated uh, wonderfully in the previous sentence. And even David's limited knowledge of how God made him staggered his imagination. The Lord had made no one else exactly like David. David was a unique creation. Today, with our modern technology, we know a, a whole lot more about the amazing growth of babies in their mother's room, womb. We know even that the womb God gives each child in the womb, God gives each child distinctive qualities. Intentionally ending that life before the world can see and benefit from those qualities is not part of God's plan. God has plans for every creation and those qualities he wants to be made known. Now look in verses 15 and 16. He says, my frame, that's his skeleton, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Woven together. Elsewhere in the Bible, this is uh, an idea that expresses elaborate weaving of cloth, as in Exodus 26, 36, where they were weaving cloth for the tabernacle. What a beautiful picture uh, of God's creative handiwork to compare it to the elaborate weaving that went on to the things that, that hung in God's tabernacle. The expression depths of the earth means a place that you just can't see. And, and what David was saying, you can't see inside a mother's womb. Now, today we can. We, we do by different methods, but David couldn't. You can't see in the mother's womb. It's a hidden place that no one could access and know what was going on. He didn't speak like a scientist. He wasn't a scientist, but David had seen children uh, born and he, he had known about the miracle. Eugene Peterson has said, in the presence of birth, we don't calculate, we marvel. Modern science has uncovered many of the details that go on in the womb. For example, look at these details here that are a part of a baby's growth in a mother's womb. They're at conception, the foundation of a child's physical characteristics, intelligence, and personality 
are established. After only 21 days, the baby's heart beats regularly and the foundation of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nervous system already are established. After 35 days, fingers can be discerned on the baby's hands. At 40 days, brain waves appear. At three months, hair begins to grow on the baby's head. At five months, the baby weighs about a pound at about 12 inches long and responds to loud, startling noises. He or she only needs nourishment, warmth, and a secure place to grow. Now, we've been able to do great things to save babies that are born prematurely, but we've done horrible things when we've interfered with the growth of babies in the womb. God does not intend for anyone to interrupt that process and end the helpless life that has begun just as he did not intend for the children of Israel and Samaria to be sacrificed on the altars of idols. And Ezekiel described that in 16 and 23 and said, that's the sin that, you know, you, you get to the point where God said, that's enough. And he says, that's the sin you've committed that's going to bring about your destruction. In, uh, in the, the 13 through 16, David describes the oversight here of God uh, as the child grows in the womb. Uh, the word translated informed comes from a root word that means wrap up, unformed, uh, wrap up or fold up together. And if you've ever seen uh, a picture of a baby in the womb, they're tightly wrap, wrapped up. They're not ready to stretch out their limbs. They're, they're in a place where they're secure. David further affirmed that all the days ordained for me are written in a book. Before I left my mother's womb, God, you knew my story. You wrote it in the book. He used similar language uh, that when he, uh, that God he called Jeremiah to be a prophet because he said he chose Jeremiah before he formed him in the womb and set him apart before his birth. The evidence of that is all throughout the Old Testament of God setting aside people to do specific things and he made plans for their life. God saw David's life and purpose from the beginning. To end before David was born would have been a travesty. A thousand years later, the Apostle Paul would affirm that David served God's purpose in his own generation. Likewise, God has a plan for each one of us. Every one of us, God knows our life written in the book. Warren Wiersbe writes this. He says, when we contemplate human birth, our first response ought to be reverence. The God of the galaxies is the God who is concerned about the color of a baby's hair and the genetic structure of a yet unborn child. We ought to bow in reverence before God and worship him because each individual child is a part of his handiwork. God knew the psalmist perfectly for he ordered the first beginnings of his life and foresaw all of his destiny. Based on the statistics that we get today from the National Right to Life Organization, since 1973, over 60 million lives have been intentionally ended in the womb since 1973. At the same time, child abuse has been a rising plague in our society. Children suffer emotional and physical and sexual abuse, abuse that often leaves deep wounds that are hard to overcome or maybe impossible. Even now, people talk about euthanasia for, for, for older people who are useless to society now, they think. The eyes of some have no value on human life. They see no value of, of certain people to society. However, all life is precious in God's sight. And Psalms uh, 139 points that out. David continues in verses 17 and 18 when he says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. What should the thoughts of the psalmist be uh, since he's come to the realization, realization that, of the part that God has played in his life and the intimate role that God has in all of creation and in everyone's life. He is so in awe of God and what God has done that it is more than he can take in. All he can do is recognize God's power and knowledge and ask God 
one to convict him of anything that he's done contrary to God's will and two, to lead him in the way everlasting. And isn't that all any of us can do? We can, we can say to God, we've committed sin, Father. We can be convicted of our sin. We've all sinned. We know that. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and God has an opportunity for us to have that sin wiped out. He, he says the, 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 that, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. We have the opportunity to have that wiped out. And so David recognized he's accountable to God and he must be convicted and that he must seek God's leadership from then on out. And then in the final verses here, he says, if only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We, we are responsible to God. We're accountable to God. But God wants to know about us and he has a promise for us. He, he promises to, to, to lead us in the way everlasting. And how do we know all of these things that, that, that David tells us in Psalm 31, 139? How do we know all of those things? We know because the Bible tells us so. We know because it's Scripture. And we need to all, always be studying Scripture. And we need to stand up for what God values. And that means God wants us to stand up for the value of human life. He wants us to, 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 to make sure. Now, we, can, we can't always win political battles, but we can continue to pray that God's will be done when it comes to the sanctity of human life. How do I know? The Bible tells me so, because Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves us all. He particularly loves little children and babies. And we need to protect those children and babies. It's a duty for us to do that as Christians. I hope that you do. And I hope that you care about children and babies that much. My prayer today is that, that this message would go out to many and this message of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ tells us will be the message that carries the day. I hope you have a good week.